social capital is a non-tangible thing you've mentioned a few times, uh, which is foundational to economies, foundational to societies, etc. And one of the ways in which we can measure stroke lubricate social capital is by measuring and fostering trust within a group of people or a community. Without trust, social capital is low. With trust, social capital is high. When your social capital is high, as you well know, things simply work better, one of which is the economy. And there's plenty of data out there showing that all sorts of things socially work far, far better with trust in the room. For you as someone who's a leader in sustainability and also someone who is leading, um, how do you bring trust to the table? One, you know, this, this was very difficult. Uh, when I came to the city, I spent the first month, I, I, you know, set a goal for me, which was to meet at least 100 new people in the first month and, and meeting and, and having a conversation with them. And I didn't do anything else. And I reached 157. I kept track of all of them. Uh, I spent large number of hours on, on Zoom early to late. And, and I, I had a better understanding, but for the most part, I knew that I, I had no idea what this city was about. You know, I just knew that there were a ton of people that were working towards a, a, a similar goal. And, and then, you know, I realized that there were issues related to, well, that became more uh, explicit since 2020, since George Floyd's death in the US. Uh, then the, the, the relationship between government and society was, was fractured. The relationships between uh, ethnic groups uh, in the city was fractured. Uh, the trust had gone away in some cases. People were just not willing to work with anybody else. Uh, I was in a meeting uh, three months into the job. Uh, I, I approached the leaders of, of the Black community in Itaca. Uh, and in that meeting, somebody told me, you are just not Black enough to understand what we're going through. And, and initially, I, I was shocked, you know, to, to hear that, mostly because my intentions were good. But, but he was making a point, you know, uh, and, and the point was, your struggles are not mine. You have yours, I have mine. And, and by understanding yours will not lead you to understand mine. And, and this was counter to, to something that I strongly believe in. And, and now I realize that it is part of what I believe in. Um, it, it comes also from another experience that, that I had. And, and you know, the, eventually I, I, when, when President Obama left office, I was invited to probably one of the last events that he had. Uh, and I was invited to give a talk. And, and when I gave that talk, uh, you know, the, the, the people before me, you know, there were nine of us that were invited to, to present that day. And all the people before me, they were talking about something really personal. You know, somebody lost uh, his son in Sandy Hook uh, in the shootout. And, and then somebody was a victim of human trafficking and somebody had a terminal illness. So when I was about to speak, I, I was overwhelmed by the moment and, and I started crying. <laughs> and, and a person that had just come off the stage literally gave me a hug. And, and I didn't know her. She came and just gave me a hug and said, dude, what you are doing here is because you want to do it. We are all victims of what we are representing. You know? And you, in a way, having the option of not doing this, you are doing it. So I think that has merit. So, so you should go up there and, and tell people why you're doing it, because I think that's what's really interesting about you. And, and you know, that informed also, I believe that I had after, you know, fortunately meeting President Obama a few times, uh, uh, he has a book called Dreams of My Father, uh, where, where he basically states, you don't have to be poor to understand poverty. You don't need to be black to understand the struggle. You don't need to go through everything to understand that people need to have access to a better life. You don't need to be a victim. You just need to pay attention and develop a level of empathy. And, and then I go back to whether I am or not black enough to understand and the relevance of that comment, because you can take it literal and, and it would be counter to that point. But then if you look at the emerging complexity and you really look at what is meant by that, it is, you were not there with me when this happened. 
you know, I need you to understand what happened after that, you know, I need you to understand how, you know, was not dignified, how, how it led to, you know, potentially problems for future employment, because I had been arrested, uh, it could mean, you know, so many different things. And, and then when you start looking at that, I realized that, yeah, I may not be black enough, but I think I am human enough to understand, you know, what, what this is. And, and, and that's how, how you start looking at this, you know, how, how you, you start thinking, okay, if I can really understand, you know, what people are going through, then I can start addressing the issue of trust. You know, there is a need for a new social contract. And everybody says that when we talk about climate change and social justice, there is a new way. There is an, a need to redefine the rules of engagement. And that has to do with redefining the role that people have to play. You know, it's not for government to define the future, it's for people to define the future. And it's not one future, it's a future that we can all live in that is very personal and, and, and goes to everybody's experience. Mm. We have a neighborhood here, South Side, that used to be like 80% black and now it is probably 5%. And, and the black community has been gentrified out of that neighborhood. And, uh, and, and that means their experience is something that I have never lived and I never, I would probably never understand fully. But what I understand is the effect that he had on families three generations later. And, and then, you know, when we talk about correcting historical inequities, it just means we need to rebuild the trust that was broken long before I came here. And we need to figure out uh, the, the new form of engagement that will invite people to be part of a new society, a new community, uh, and a new form of looking at the world. And what unites us all is the need for that, precisely. You know, we all agree we need to change things. This is not working out, uh, certainly not for everybody. So eventually I, I started working with uh, community leaders at every level. And, uh, and we started a program that I think you would appreciate. Uh, it's called 1000 Conversations with the Community. And we, we are, you know, around 400 now. We are video recording uh every conversation and and it's very neat because right now we're at the point where we're about to do our first cut because from all of those recorded conversations there is a thread you know which is not apparent but some conversations last 30 seconds some of them last one hour and a half but if you take bits and pieces you can tell a whole story through the voices of 400 different people and that story is not only what we are, but what we could become. And, and it's just such a beautiful project, man. I, it, it really is. And, and I think when we're done cutting, you know, the, the 60 minute reel that describes our community after the 1000 conversations, I think, you know, it, it's gonna be nice to see that we are coming together because I have, I have seen that, you know, how separate we were at the beginning and how this project, such an intense project has brought us all together in a different way. So I think we are rebuilding trust. Send me a link. I'd, I'd, I'd love to see that. Yeah, yeah, I'll send you a link. It's, it's, it's a fun project. I asked you, how do, we, how do you bring trust back to the table as such a prominent person in your community? And let me just reflect back to you three headlines that you gave me. Number one, essentially, you started with trying to convince someone else that you're human enough. And that we're all human enough. That's number one, beyond what separates us. Secondly, acknowledge the fact that that's not enough to acknowledge that. But we also need to re-engineer a social contract, the way in which we do life together, which is more just than the way in which we've lived in the past. And number three, it's about telling a story, not of only who we are, but of who we can become. And in that, we're bringing trust back to the table. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that that would be. Uh, I mean, the way you build trust is, is, you know, it's not that you're ignoring the past. The past definitely informs, you know, what you can do together. But also, you know, allows you to see that, you know, there is a future in which we could converge and, and you start driving in that direction. And, and it's a very natural process. That's the other thing. You know, you don't have to convince people we need to go that way. Everybody wants to move forward mm -hmm. and everyone wants a better life. And, and I, I don't waste time trying to understand what a better life means for everybody. I just want to understand the basic principles that lead to that. Yeah. And, and then, then you can probably do it. And yeah, that's, that's how you build trust. Yeah.